we are yet again revealing another special guest who we have referenced many times over the past two years of this podcast, but haven't put maybe like mentioned the name, but haven't put a name or a face behind her. So um, if you've listened to pretty much all of our episodes, I feel like we've mentioned at least one at some point, the nervous system and always referencing the body. And we've talked specifically about our healing journeys. And I talked about somatic therapy a bunch in my episode. Um, And we're just so grateful to actually be in relationship with a lot of these healers that have really impacted us along the way. Um, And so we're so happy to have um, my somatic therapist on today, Eleanor from Baltimore. And Eleanor, we'd love for you to introduce yourself, anything that feels relevant and the work that you do um, in the world to our audience. Hi, everybody. Wow, what what an honor to live into. I had no idea I was being spoken to about (laughs) the world for a few years, but so nice to virtually be with you all. Um, So I am a somatic therapist. We'll talk more later about what that means, I'm sure. And some of the things I do in the world are, I founded Bodywise Institute, which is a professional development institute. We offer trauma trainings for folks on the front line, like nurses and school teachers, social workers, massage therapists, yoga teachers. And all of our trainings are nervous system informed we explore all of the education through the body. So we're using all body-based preventative and interventions. And it's a really culturally informed container. So we have a a huge component on social justice and systemic oppression and the role that we hold as a leader in that conversation around power and privilege. We have some really amazing faculty members, all of whom I wish like I could be when I grow up. I feel so inspired, I get to work with them. And then pretty quickly it became clear that the folks who need access the most are the folks that have the least access. And so we founded Bodywise Foundation shortly thereafter. And we've done a lot of very cool projects. Um, In fact, before the pandemic, we were running research on trauma-informed yoga. The VA was funding it. We lost it during the pandemic, these things happen, but we do a lot of work with the nonprofit at the access point of social justice and trauma. And it's very, very, very rewarding. And then part of the week, I'm in private practice as a somatic therapist. So that's a little bit about me professionally. And I have a feeling some personal flavors will start to come up throughout the episode and we'll just let that happen organically. But ladies, thank you so much for having me here in the space. I'm so excited to be here. Welcome to The Fifth Element. A podcast for people seeking intimate connection with their innermost self through holistic healing, cosmic consciousness, and radical rebirth. We hope each episode is an opportunity for listeners to join the collective journey towards intuition and integration. You mentioned uh, nervous system informed work, and I feel like maybe some of our listeners have heard trauma informed, but is there a difference between nervous system informed and what does that look like? Yeah, it's a great question. And so first, I think it's really critical. We acknowledge that trauma theory is trauma theory. It's an incredibly new field and one that we are still growing our understanding in. In fact, the word trauma was only coined in 1980. That wasn't that long ago. And we know that in Western science, in most hospital settings, after there's a discovery, it takes about a decade before it's integrated. So for example, one of my best friends is a GI and an attending at Hopkins, and he doesn't need to take any nutrition classes. So the reason I name this is it's trauma theory, not trauma fact. This is an evolving conversation. And every week we understand more and more about what trauma is and what that means. And I think that the concept of trauma 
everyone's going to interpret that word with their own pre-existing experience, but everybody has a nervous system. And starting to language it in that way and saying, hey, this is nervous system informed, where we're orienting to the fact that we are all human animals. We all have ancient nervous systems. We all experience stress and overwhelm. And it really changes the way we can have that conversation. So it is trauma-informed education, but we're really like in addition to learning how to create safe space and, and understand what trauma is and how it shows up in the body, we're really inviting people as providers to understand their own nervous systems. And first and foremost, before even stepping into whatever room it is that they're in, where I invite Guiding them to regulate their own nervous system. So I hope that helps. It sounded like a little bit of a nebulous answer. I'm noticing the thing that I want to share right now is really, really simple. And it's for all of us, our listeners as well. Take a moment and scan the space that you're in. Orient to the world around you. And as you do this, recognize that you are a human animal. And the only way you could ever feel safe is if you recognize there's no threat in the room, real or perceived. If you look behind you, you go, oh, hey, no bear. <laughs> and I'm looking you over the other shoulder. Oh, hey, no bear. And that is something that is so simple, so subtle, but so significant. Just the experience of orienting to a space changes your nervous system's ability to downregulate. Amazing. Um, we definitely use the word or use the phrase like regulate your nervous system. And I feel like there's a lot of, um, a lot more talk about the nervous system, which is amazing just on, you know, I'm mostly thinking of like social media and a lot of these bigger accounts starting to talk about nervous system regulation. So does that mean what most people mean of just like staying calm or like getting to a place of low stress? Or can you dive into a little bit more of what it means to regulate your nervous system? Sure. How long do I have? Three days? <laughs> <laughs> as long as you want. So I'll use an example to start. One of my best friends was rock climbing and shattered her leg. And when the paramedics came, her heart rate was really low. They said her blood pressure was the lowest of any humans they'd ever taken who had shattered their leg. She's also a trauma therapist, somatic therapist, long-term meditator, works with plant medicine. She does a lot of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. Like that's a huge part of her life. And not only was she just appearing calm on the outside, but she was actually pretty regulated on the inside. And those two things are different. I'm sure we all have had those experiences where we look cool as a cucumber on the outside and inside we feel like we're a duck paddling underwater so fast and no one can see us, but on the top it's calm. Well, so the difference is what's happening on the inner world. And there's a difference between being calm and present and from center and shut down, spacey, numb, dissociative, tired, off, dull. They're very, very different. And so I'm just like kind of tracking here how far we can go into the subject. It sounds like we've, we've started exploring polyvagal theory here, like what is the nervous system? And most people in our culture now have a concept of, okay, there's there's rest, digest, and there's sympathetic fight flight. But the nervous system is more complicated than that. We've discovered that there's this place called ventral that is safe, at ease, at rest, present, right? This is the place where we can play, where, where we can engage in learning things, learning new languages. This is a place where executive function is available, where our resources are here. And let's say we were in that state and we were walking through the woods and we heard this loud sound. 
So we would immediately need to go into a sympathetic fight flight state. So we would startle and then, oh, guess what? We would orient. Our bodies would flood with hormones like norepinephrine and cortisol. Our pupils would dilate, heart would change. So we could run or we could fight and we would be in this sympathetic state. Or if we discovered that fighting and flighting wasn't a viable option, like if the tree was about to fall on us, we would go into the dorsal branch, which is the complete shutdown sort of immobilization branch. So we have these three nervous system branches, the shutdown, immobilized, collapse, I can't. We have the sympathetic fight flight activation mobilized. And then we have the ventral. We have the regulated, the at ease, the um, like present and able to respond to reality. So those are sort of the three tiers of the autonomic nervous system in a, in a nutshell. And there are people who live in sympathetic all the time. Like they live there and they appear regulated. They appear together. And what they're doing, like they're in that sympathetic state all the time to function, they put the brake on top of it. So they have the gas and the brake on all the time. This is called a faux window of tolerance or a fake window of tolerance. They look like they're in their window of tolerance, but they're not. They've maybe never even been in one. And so those people, there's a lot like, I work with someone who was a Supreme Court person looked regulated as all get out, highly functioning, very dynamic. No one knew this about her. Every two months, she would just completely crash and burn and need to go away for the weekend and just collapse. So she looked really regulated from the outside, but biologically her system, the cost of doing business was extraordinarily high. And think about it, if you're in a sympathetic state, digestion turns off because if you're running from a bear, who cares about your sandwich, right? Like it's just not relevant. And so if her system is always in that state of activation and to manage it, she kind of puts the brake on top of it, all kinds of biological processes aren't able to happen. Cellular repair, digestion, there's so many things. And so there's a difference between looking like you're crushing it and highly functioning and deep regulation and health and nervous system plasticity and a window of tolerance that, that is quite wide where you can manage the stress of everyday life and stay in that ventral state. Does that help answer the question? Yeah, to me it does. And I was, I was mostly thinking about that concept of plasticity too of, and it goes with that window of tolerance idea that it doesn't mean you like regulating your nervous system doesn't mean you have to shut yourself off from all stress so that you're always regulated and calm. But really the concept that you've taught me of learning exactly what you said, like learning to be resilient, learning to deal with the stress and expand that from a place of center rather than, um, yeah, a place of like constant stress. So I think a lot of people maybe even write off nervous system healing because they're like, my life is too stressful or chaotic. I can't have these moments of quiet or peace. And I can't, you know, always guarantee that I'm not going to have stress. And to me that the beauty of it comes from, well, actually you're learning to just manage that in a really healthy way. That's not surface level, not just this like functioning on the outside, but truly being able to handle life a lot more. And one thing that really drew me to you and your work was like, you shared a lot of your story with me along the way. And I could see myself in your story of, um, you know, me not even knowing what I was feeling when I first met you. And now, you know, I can, when I'm, experiencing a physical symptom or even like an emotion I can I can track where it is in my body and that has been such a gift but um I guess my next question for you would be like how did you find this world and this path um because yeah I I I think we all find 
these paths from a place of like personal, a lot of times personal, like healing or suffering. Um, so I'd love to hear anything you want to share about how you got into the world of nervous system and somatic therapy and all that. Yeah. Well, I think that's exactly right. We teach what it is we need and it shapes us and grows us and stretches us in the ways that we need. Um, and so I sure did find this path because I needed it. I didn't even know it. <sighs> so I used to be, I lived all over the world. I lived in Central America. I moved there when I was 17 by myself and started a company. And then I um, moved to India and I was there for two years. And you know, I'd been all over, I'd done a lot of self-discovery work, was really interested in human potential, was really into mountaineering at the time. And I came back to the States and became a well, a lot of other things happened, many, many other things, but, but eventually I became a rolfer or a structural integrator, which is a really beautiful form of manual therapy that realigns the, yeah, like along the way I'd become a professional acrobat. Like there were, there were a lot of stops, but eventually I became a rolfer. And this is a 12 journey, 12 session journey that completely realigns the skeleton. And when I went and had my first session, there was no pain in my body. I was a professional athlete and I grew like an inch and a half and experienced so much more freedom and movement and ease. And my day-to-day -day life took less energy. And I learned a lot about myself through the way that I held myself and why and look where those patterns had gotten laid down in my body. So I became fascinated and I left my field and I became a rolfer. And what was really interesting to me is that over and over and over, people would have these emotional experiences on the table. And again, it's not, it's not body work, it's not massage therapy, it's literally a restructuring of the skeleton through working with the soft tissue that holds the skeleton. Um, and then they would get up off the table and there would have been this huge postural realignment. I was like, wow, what is happening? So I always believed, you know, our issues are in our tissues and our body tells the story of our lives. I remember when I lived in India, I worked on staff for a yoga teacher training program. And my teacher, this amazing old Indian fellow, he could watch someone walk through the hallway in their boxers or bikini and tell you the story of their life. Hey, you played the saxophone. You were a soccer player because our bodies moved based on the external demand. You know, and if you look up people like Katie Bowman, these biomechanists, they study how literally the external demand or force, if you're a power lifter, the ligaments, tendons, bones will lay down differently than if you're ballerina. Right? So, so only 20% of our experience is our genes and about 80%, right? We have these genomics that can express themselves in thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of different ways. The external demand that we place on ourselves determines who we become, how we look, our brain pathways. Think about it. If you grew up um, it, with a family that ate fast food and watched a lot of TV and was relatively sedentary, your life would be very different than if you grew up with a family that was off grid in Alaska and you had to haul your water and grow your own food and hunt. You would be very, very different in both physical appearance and also mindset and neural pathway and resilience. So, oh, one little side mark about resilience, what you're saying before is no, no, no. Like it's not about living a calm, peaceful life. In fact, that won't create a lot of resilience. When people go to the gym, you break down the muscle fibers and they come back stronger. And so the concept is you stress. You have to under, you have to put your body and nervous system under just as much stress as it can manage. And then it comes back more resilient. Too much stress, distress breaks the muscle or the nervous system. So nervous system plasticity is really all about continuing to grow the nervous system's capacity to, to self-regulate, to manage, and it needs adversity to do that. Okay, back to our regularly scheduled programming. So anyway, I, I knew the body 
had so much intelligence. Uh, I remember being seven years old and with my aunt and she had this foot surgery where she had to put her foot in ice cold water and then hot, ice cold water and hot. And I was bringing her the buckets of ice and the steaming hot water. I was thrilled, she hated it. I had so much fun. And she told me that she had put off surgery for a long time because she'd read a book by Dr. Sarno that said that sometimes back pain is incomplete emotional material showing up to get your attention. And that single moment changed my life, seven years old. Thank God she didn't under talk to me like I was a child. She gave me a real answer because in that moment, I understood that every experience we have writes its story in our bodies. And then there was experience after experience that that started to help me understand what that meant. Like I had this North node in my being since seven because of that one comment, but I didn't have the languaging. I didn't have the, the biomechanical or the nervous system or the physiology to understand it, but I started like listening. So anyway, my teacher in India really started to give me more information to understand. Many years later, I was a rolfer, so I'm here, deep reverence for the body, watching people's bodies restructure themselves when an emotional breakthrough happens. You know, they talk about something that happens as a teenager and being trapped in a desk all the time and their scoliotic deviation unwinds or whatever. And so this was all going on. I was really into Edo Portal. I was really into natural movement, changing the brain and like, like changing the way the body, bones and tendons and ligaments lay themselves down. And Somehow, I have no idea how, I saw that there was a trauma-informed yoga training at Kripalu. I'd never even heard the word trauma really. And some part of me is like, go, just go. And my partner and I had just moved to a new city. Like we, you know, moving is expensive. We were young. And he's like, if you know you need to do it, like just do it. It was not in, like a strategic move or a financially responsible one, but I went and I was sitting there and I had all of these light bulbs start going off. And all of a sudden I started understanding my life in a way I, I just had, had never even considered. And then from that moment onwards, I dove head first, feet first, body first, fell into this trauma-informed conversation. And what, I, what really ended up happening was this field called me so that I could heal my own nervous system. And and it's been a really cool journey. That's so amazing. Wow. Um, did you experience somatic therapy before becoming a somatic therapist yourself and maybe even getting into what even is somatic therapy? Like how do these things get applied in sessions? Yeah, no, I had never had a, a session in somatic therapy before wow. I went. So when I saw the trauma-informed yoga training at Kripalu, like I, I simply just knew I needed to go. I had this deep knowing. I had no idea what trauma even meant. I had no idea I had a trauma history. And I think cognitively, the way I justified it to myself was maybe I can understand why like from a deeper level or a, a neuroscience perspective, why people's bodies can realign when there's an emotional breakthrough. But in a deep sort of like, and that ended up happening. I now have that education. I now understand deeply how that can occur. But I think I'm, I'm certain there was just this deep knowing in my spirit and soul and impulse towards my own personal healing. And some part of my psyche knew that that was the path would give me the tools to heal my own nervous system. And I just had to follow. I think that longing is often the start of many great things or those little seeds of understanding and knowing all of the sudden one will germinate in our being and we can choose to follow that knowing without knowing why, or we can you know, put it out and forever live a diminished life one that's not the life we're here to live. And so since that moment, whenever I have those experiences of knowing, that kind of just like, like there is no reason 
I follow it and I won't let anything stop me because it has always led me to where I'm supposed to be. And so after the trauma-informed yoga training, um, then I continued my, my training and I did a three-year training with Dr. Peter Levine in somatic experiencing. And since then I've done years and years and thousands and thousands of hours of trainings on many things <laughs> that relate to the body's wisdom. The way you're describing um, the body's knowing and also just like your own response to this work and coming to it um, is just what we, our favorite thing to talk about on the podcast, which is intuition um, and just trusting that. Um, and, you know, it's hard to kind of like quantify what intuition is um, to people, uh, but, and I don't think we necessarily need to, but this connection to just like what resonates in your body, what do you just like know in your bones? What does the ancient wisdom of like your fascia and the way that your body responds to things like is such an easy entrance point into connecting with that sense of inner knowing. Um, just yesterday I was thinking about like the subconscious mind and I was, I wrote down, I was like, is it the subconscious mind or is it the conscious body? Ooh. Kind of like guides and directs us. Oh, Keely. That's amazing. <laughs> wow. Yeah. When you're describing the like impulse to follow, it's like reminding me of in somatic therapy sessions, you're guiding us to follow the impulse of our actual body. So you can, I'm like doing this with my hands right now. And if you were watching me, you'd be like, you know, keep doing that. Like, what does that want? What do you want to do with that? And where is that leading you? And yeah, there's so much insight that we, that doesn't lie um, from, from our body, from our tissues. Um, so what would you, how would you describe what goes on in a session to somebody? And, you know, I feel like I've tried to explain to people and I'm like, I don't know. It's just, you learn about, to me, it's been a lot of learning about my body, learning about my responses, becoming aware so that I can notice like, oh yeah, I'm tensing up in this moment or I'm wanting to walk away or just like becoming more aware of my instincts um, and then, you know, becoming more aware of how I can communicate with my body. Um, but you, it's in such a skillful way. Like a lot of the time I feel, I have felt like this session was a lot of orienting around the room, a lot of breathing, a lot of going inward. And yet at the end of it, I'm like, wait, I just feel like I, you know, solved this big mystery about some way I was feeling or really went back into places that talk therapy had never really brought me to. And I kind of didn't even realize how I got there. Um, so what are some of the things that, that you do in a session, um, with people that get them to those groundbreaking places? Mm, yeah. Well, I can share about what I do and there's a lot of different forms of somatic therapy. And I think that that's, that's important just to denote here. Um, and there are many different pathways to becoming a somatic therapist. So my pathway was a three-year training, but I did not go through graduate level mental health clinical training on purpose because there's a lot of jurisdiction around what you can and cannot do with your clients. And so I chose a different pathway, but within each scope or each orientation or each pathway, all of these different trainings, Pat Ogden, you know, Peter Levine, um, alchemical alignment, they're, they're all understanding that the nervous system is in the body. And there's research now, Dr. Kathy King, and Dr. Stephen Tyrell have a book called Nurturing Resilience and quite a few different trainings. They specialize in developmental trauma and they do all of it as a nonverbal process of healing. And um, it's actually incredible. Like their trainings blow my freaking mind. They can rewire the brainstem. They can rewire the attachment system. They can change the nervous system. They can increase resilience, like increase vagal tone, all non-verbally through touch. 
But in one of their trainings, they spoke to a research study where they had a clinical mental health provider offer an intervention and offer the same intervention with skillful, safe, intentional touch. And the outcomes were much better through touch because there is a language in our body that predates the verbal. You know, even people who are fairly, very verbally precocious, there's still a way that communication is happening before that. And research has been showing for many decades that only about 7% of communication is verbal. Most of it is happening in the subtle micro and macro expressions of the body movement and vocal prosody. So when we have a feeling or an emotion, they're not ideas either. Those are also things that are happening here in, in our bodies. Like anger is a surge of heat or the contraction of gut or the bracing of the muscles. It's not, hey, I'm angry and that's an idea. When you think a thought that makes you angry or hear or see something, the body floods in these hormones. There's this neuropeptide surge. And all of those sensations, like that is what makes up anger. And people who have left their body, who've dissociated, dissociation is when we leave the body because the body can't move. They might have that surge of hormones. And then the brain recognizes that surge of hormones and then they think another thought about being angry and then they flood with more hormones and you can be on this, this sort of hamster loop for 20, 30, 50 years and be completely cut off from the neck down and not feeling any of it. But it inhibit it, it will reorient every thought that you have. What's happening in the body is your doorway to present moment reality. And so just like anger isn't an idea, terror, overwhelm, aliveness, vitality, connection, joy. Those are all chemical markers that are happening in the body too. And if we're not able to feel what's happening in our bodies, right? All of those things are still happening. We are still living through this body. We're just literally like unable to access it. It's like we're not able to access our home. And being disembodied is a perform found of trauma. It's incredibly vulnerable. So in a session with me, a, a huge part of what we do is we relearn the language of the body. And if we left the body because the body was too unsafe to be in, then we do that in a very slow, titrated, safe way back. And as we start regaining access to the body, then we start teaching ourselves how to regulate the nervous system. So when the nervous system starts to get activated, we're like, oh, that's okay. And we can come back to baseline. When the nervous system starts shutting down or going into that kind of collapse mode, it's like, that's okay too. And we can come back to baseline. And we just start teaching these cycles of activation, deactivation that increasingly get larger and larger so that outside of the office, the client's nervous system is able to self-regulate. Like, autonomically in their day-to-day -day living. They, they no longer have to think about it. Their systems are starting to self-regulate. And then depending on their lives, we, we might go back and renegotiate past trauma. And they might know what the trauma was. Like they might be like, hey, there was a surgery or a car accident or horrendous assault, but they might also not know. And that's okay. The body remembers. There is literally, <laughs> the body remembers. So an example, I worked with this fellow and he was really, really intense. I haven't slept in six months. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> what happened six months ago? I had the surgery. Oh, okay. You know, and so how did it go? Great. I'm going to run a hundred miles through the desert and I do these ultra marathons. And I'm like, wow, that's great. You know, <laughs> And so his brain was telling me knee surgery was amazing, but his body was telling me that knee surgery was threatening because every time he talked about knee surgery, his pupils dilated and his heart rate went up. So I knew there was something in there. So we started to work the knee surgery. And sure enough, and I'm tracking the impulses in his body. I'm learning from his body, right? His brain doesn't remember consciously. 
eventually when we started moving his chin back slowly, he started choking and choking and choking and had this like impulse to push and kick away. And he started sleeping. So we called the surgeon and we're like, what happened? And when he was intubated, when the breathing tube went in, they slipped for a moment and he felt like he was suffocating. And so his brain didn't remember, but his body did. The body has no narrative. If something horrendous happens, like you lose an infant during delivery, you have to keep functioning. You have to keep functioning to save other lives. So you do. And sometimes that means leaving the body to keep functioning. Or, right, like the body's flooded with cortisol because you are working to save that infant. The body doesn't know the difference between saving an infant and running from a bear. It's got the same chemical marker. And so something that your brain doesn't think is traumatic, your body might interpret as traumatic. If you're in an activated state, even something like someone reaching across the table for the salt can appear and feel incredibly threatening on our nervous system level. So we go in and we start reading, that's the third. So, so first we reintroduce ourselves to the body. Then we start practicing nervous system regulation. And then we renegotiate trauma. Sometimes we know what it is. Sometimes we don't, but it's anything that the body perceived as threat. And there are a lot of different tools for this. I have many, many years of training and it's different depending on what's needed in the moment. And then after that, I like to start orienting towards thriving. So I also lived in Buddhist monastery. I have training, um, I've started my training in internal family systems, parts work. I have a lot of training on transgenerational trauma from a soul perspective and an epigenetic perspective on the attachment system and developmental trauma. And so after we started renegotiating, after you're living at home in the body again, after there's been this experience of self-regulation, then we start doing the soul retrieval who the fuck are you? Like your soul came a really long way with a gift that is only yours to deliver. And how do we support you in thriving and vitality and bringing that forward into the world, like living the life that's only yours to live. And so that's sort of the spectrum and trajectory. And people come in at different points on that trajectory into my office, but I will only work with people who don't want to be fixed, who want to thrive, and who want to find out why they're here. Wow, that's such an incredible story about that man and the body remembering. And I think about that all the time. Just that concept of even if I don't know what's going on, and I don't know if there's a story there, but I I can now get to a place where I can, um, you know, like hit a pillow or turn the lights off and just do some like shaking or something and then see what my body wants to do instead of like kind of having all these stories about, oh, I should or I shouldn't feel this way because there's no reason to. It's kind of just this theme that we've been talking about on the podcast this season of like your body not lying your body always trying to like orient you towards what is and you said this like what is in in the moment and what's here for us to like work with so that's such a great example of how this type of therapy can be really beneficial even if you don't think there's anything you need to talk about or like there's anything that you need to deal with um especially if you're someone that's having like recurring physical symptoms or like chronic pain, like that's always, whenever anyone's coming to me with that sort of stuff, I'm like, I think you should go for somatic therapy first and foremost, because there's something there that, yeah, maybe you can't track it in your mind, but that is such an easy entryway for this type of therapy. And can you think of anyone else, if not everyone who this type of therapy would benefit? (laughs) <laughs> shout them out so that if they hear and they're like that's me and we'll put the link to the se practitioner training i feel like i'm always telling people start there but um yeah who do you think this this work would benefit in this type of therapy yeah so i think everybody <laughs> yeah. 
Because our nervous systems learn how to self-regulate. We're not born with the ventral part of our vagus nerve myelinated. And so if our caregiver is not self-regulating the nervous system while they're holding us, we don't have that full range and capacity. So no matter how good your life is, if you want it to be better, do nervous system work. Like, mm -hmm. But if you're noticing that there are reoccurring things in your life that are challenging, it might point to the nervous system. For example, people who are binge eating often, that is from a nervous system perspective and unconscious valiant attempt to downregulate the nervous system. You are manually forcing the nervous system into a more parasympathetic rest digest, right? So when we see things like binge eating or anorexic behavior, sleeping all the time, not being able to sleep, feeling a lot of anxiety, bracing muscles, racing thoughts, hypervigilance, feeling a lot of flat affect, lethargy, collapsed, shut down energy, brain fog, spaciness. Um, whenever there's substance abuse disorder, that is an indicator that there's nervous system dysregulation. Dr. Gabor Mate, a pioneer in the field, he has the highest success rate with heroin addicts. And he doesn't take the heroin away. He gives them tools to self-regulate the nervous system. Heroin's just a symptom not the problem. And in fact, they aren't heroin addicts. They're people doing heroin behavior. That person isn't an anorexic. They're doing anorexic behavior out of an unconscious attempt to self-regulate. If someone works out all the time, if someone is the VP of New Balance, <laughs> from a nervous system perspective, heroin is the same as being a like overly functioning executive. Right. From from a system perspective, explosive rage and depression are the same thing. Mm -hmm. So if you find yourself scrolling on your phone all the time, if you find yourself um, using humor when you feel uncomfortable or getting angry when you feel uncomfortable or people pleasing is actually a part of the dorsal nervous system. It's a survival strategy. Isn't that wild, right? Those are all things that might suggest you would grow immensely from some nervous system informed support. Yeah. Yeah. So that is everyone pretty much. <laughs> that sounds just yeah. like anything that's like compulsively done. Is that like the overarching? Well, I mean, some of that's not compulsive either, right? Like for example, some people using humor, I'm just thinking, I guess it's kind of like responses, like in our responses, trauma responses, I guess, would look different, whether we're using shopping or drugs or people or our phones. Versus, right. Yeah. Versus, I mean, maybe even painting the picture of like what, what your life looks like when you do implement this stuff, like maybe that would paint a picture as well for people of that potential on the other side, what your life can feel like. Sure. And that'll feel different from everyone. But for example, like if someone's having trouble sleeping, that might not be a compulsive behavior. If there's chronic pain or autoimmune or GI issues, GI issues are a huge trauma symptom. Um, we're actually going to do a webinar that teaches about this, but there's something called the gut brain access that connects the enteric nervous system to the brain. And when the gut is disrupted, when your gut microbiome is disrupted, it tells the nervous system you're in danger all the time, which is one of the reasons that, um, there's a lot of disordered eating in the nutrition field. And, uh, like if, if you're under threat, digestion turns off. So if your body thinks your threat and the nervous system is dysregulated, your whole GI system might not work. So there's often a lot of GI issues related to nervous system dysregulation. So basically I would say, you know, this will have a different for flavor for everyone, but an integrated life is one where you feel right, like genuinely a sense of ease in your day-to-day -day way of being and presence. And like, you're able to take in and notice the things around you that are working. And there's, there's not a lot of drama in your relationships. Like 
those are the kind of general hallmarks of nervous system regulation, that there's a sense of presence and ease in your way of being, that there's an aliveness. Beautiful. <laughs> it's <Wow>. so nebulous. <laughs> right. No, but I know what you mean, because uh, for a lot of years of my life, part of my like brand was I would be like, oh, I feel like my mission in life is to just always convince other people that I'm more chill than I actually am. Because it was that like on the outside, I was like somewhat like a pillar, like someone could come to and like talk to and, you know, was like a grounding force for them. But like inside, I was like, I'm not okay, but I can't let anyone know that. So yeah, I feel like a lot of people operate from that space of like, I have to keep it together. I have to look like I'm keeping it together so I can like get all my tasks done. Right, right. That's such a good, Keely, I think that's a great way of explaining the byproduct of somatic therapy. It doesn't matter how it looks on the outside. It matters what the felt sense experiences on the inside. And if your life is one of regulation and ease, who cares what it, and it'll look different outside for everyone. And it could look great outside, but not have that sense of ease. Only. Yep. Thank you for this wisdom and everything you've shared. And um, I'd love for you to share any resources you have where people can find you, where people can find other SE therapists and anything you have going on. Totally. So Somatic Experiencing, I'm a huge fan. You can go to their website and find a provider directory. Also, anyone who is trained with Dr. Kathy Kane, huge fan of her folks. Um, so resilience and regulation is one of their very cool trainings. Craniosacral providers are very good at helping regulate the nervous system, but don't pick someone that just did their first training. Pick someone who like lives and breathes craniosacral and has gone back for repeated education. So those are resources that are really helpful for you. Um, I do have a private practice. I tend to be waitlisted, but my graduation rate is high. So you're always welcome to reach out to me. Bodywise Institute, um, come on over. We offer a lot of free resources. Every other month we run a, a webinar called Resilient AF and each time it's on something different. We give people tools to build resiliency and neuroplasticity and to thrive. And when you sign up for one, then you'll have a link to the archive where we put all of them. So there's these like master classes. Um, we just started this, but they're, they're being attended more and more and more. So we're going to keep doing it and bring in other experts. We're also offering a free webinar series for birth workers on trauma-informed care in response to the potential abortion ban. There's more and more need for that. So feel free to share that with any birth workers you might know. And then in addition to having professional trainings, you know, if you're a yoga teacher or a mental health provider, we would love to, to educate you. We are also putting out at the end of this year, a 12 module thriving course for people who want to learn about their nervous system and to grow and have a deep like inner journey um, that is not related to their profession. Great. Thank you. We'll include all wow, of those. So many gifts. Yeah. yeah. Anything else you want to share or do you feel complete? That's everything. Thanks so much for having me, ladies. Thank you. This is so awesome.